Have you ever had a book that intimidated you? Maybe you were in school and you saw it and you picked it up and it was, you know, this thick and the print was this small and you're like, how am I ever going to get through this? And then you opened it up and the words didn't quite make sense and you weren't sure exactly how you were going to even understand what you were looking at. I had that experience when I was in school the first time that I was uh, shown a copy of Moby Dick. It was big and it was thick and you started to get into it and it was hard to understand and I'm expecting this giant battle with a whale because that's all the pictures I'd ever had in my head of it and the, there's like nothing happening forever. I'm like, how in the world am I going to finish this thing? And it was at the point where it didn't take me very long before I decided we're just going to put this down and maybe we'll come back to it later, but it's not going to really be for me right now. I think for a lot of people, that's how we approach this, our Bibles. Uh, for some of us, the Bible isn't just something that we have, but it's something that can be intimidating. It's something that because of the way the wording is placed in it, we're like, I don't even know what we're talking about here. Because it was written uh, so long before we were alive, some of the context and the things that are spoken about don't connect with where we are. At least that's how we think about it when we approach it. In fact, for some of us, the Bible might be something that we're a fan of, but what we really have is just something that sits on our, our table. Maybe we have one of the really big ones with the, they're beautiful pictures, but there's lots of these and thous, and so we never open it, we never read it, we never really approach it. And yet we're told over and over again how important it is to read it. In fact, here's a little secret. Because so few of us really get into it, People tell us all the time things they claim are in the Bible that aren't. But we don't know that because we haven't spent enough time opening it up and getting into it and reading it. But this here is beautiful. And there's something about it that is different than anything else. And so today I kind of want to take some time to talk about that, not so much in a, in a let me preach to you, but as a way of just kind of, hey, can we open this up together and find a way to take some of the intimidation and maybe some of the confusion out of it so that you'll have a chance to actually open it up yourself and see what it has to say to you and about you without feeling like you've got to put it down and maybe save it for another time. So what in the world does the Bible even say about itself? Well, one thing it says that these words alone are just words, you know? There are things on a page that are letters and sounds put in sequences, and that's what they are if it's just words. But there's something that's going on with this that is unique in a way. Because the Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of God, comes and brings these words to life. It makes them powerful. It gives them a, a vibrancy. It gives them an authority because He is there in the midst of them. And He's there in the midst of them because this is for us. Paul was telling the people in Rome this centuries ago when he said, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. This isn't just something that God plopped down and said, Okay, listen, read it. It's, it's for us to give us encouragement and hope and the perseverance we need to keep pressing forward to the end. And not only is it for us, but it's for us from God. And because it's from God, it's not pointless. It has a specific purpose. Paul was writing to his protege, Timothy, about this one time. He's writing in the letters. He's kind of telling him, well, these are all the things you really need to know. This is the stuff that you're going to have to go through because... You're young, and I wish I had known this when I was your age versus now. And he gets to it. I love the way the, the message puts this in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. This is when he's talking about what this is. And again, it doesn't have to look like mine. 
It doesn't even have to be in this form. It can be on this. I don't care. But this is the purpose that God has given it. It says, There is nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way of salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Every part of Scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us the truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the Word, we are put together and shaped up for the tasks God has for us. So I want to read it again. I want you to catch. This is the purpose of this Bible right here for you and for me. There is nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Every part of Scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us the truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word we are put together and shaped up for the tasks God has for us. This is fully inspired by God. It is God-breathed. It doesn't mean that God kind of possessed people and sucked in and then typed or wrote out what he wanted to, but through their personality, they were inspired to write what God needed us to know so that we would know his saving plan in this world. A plan that says, I love you, and I've created this good and beautiful world for you. And one of the things that makes it good and beautiful is that you have the choice to love because love always requires a choice to either be accepted or rejected. But because of that, things are broken. Because not everyone has chosen to love God back. But God didn't let that be the end of the story. Instead, this tells us all of the ways God has worked and is working to fix what is broken and bring us back home to Him. And because that is the purpose, and God is actively involved in it, the Word of God never gets wasted. Even when you feel like you're rushed or you don't have time or you don't quite get it, it is never wasted. Isaiah, speaking for God, said, My word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So this is what we have access to. And if we want to have this living relationship with God, if we want to know what it means to be like Him, if we want to be shaped and filled and equipped for the purpose of our lives, this becomes indispensable because of that. But it can be hard sometimes if you're coming to it to get into it because it's not set up like the books that you and I normally read. This is not written in the same style as Diary of a Wimpy Kid or even Lord of the Rings. There is a different way that this is organized. And so we should probably figure that out too. So most of you, if you have a Bible in your hand or on your phone, you're looking at 66 different books that have been collected together. And within the first couple hundred years after Jesus' life, the church said, these are the ones that we know, that we know, that we know were inspired by God to be the standard. And they were collected together to form the Bible that we know today. And there's, again, 66 books of them. And in this book are all kinds of different types of literature. You're going to find poems and songs. You're going to find royal records and biographies. You're going to find little stories. You're going to find prophecies. You're going to find historical accounts. You're going to find all kinds of different types of literature. And so that means that there's going to be some parts that you're going to want to read a little bit differently than others, right? Like a poem is a little bit different to read than a historical record. I mean, that doesn't mean that none of them are true, though. It's all got truth that we need to understand God's saving plan, right? That's the purpose. And every bit of it fits that. It's kind of like a newspaper. A newspaper is there supposedly 
to, if it's done right, to inform us. And it does it in different ways. Like you read the uh, opinion section different than you read the front page article, a little bit different than you read the comics, but all of them are trying to communicate truth to you if it's done right. This Bible that you have, those 66 books, were organized into two parts. One part is the Old Testament. And this is the part that recounts God's interactions with Israel. It starts from the beginning of creation, and it follows through until Israel is formed, till a covenant is made of this is how we're going to live together, interact together, and how that covenant played out in history for several centuries. The other part is the New Testament. And the New Testament tells the story of Jesus and the early church and what that looked like in the world. And all of this deals with covenants, which is simply the way that God says, I'm going to make a a commitment to you, and this is your side of the commitment, and this is my side of the commitment. Then these commitments are here to help us deal with this problem of sin and brokenness so that we can get to the solution of the problem where I save you. Now, in each of these Old Testament and New Testament, you can break them down a little bit further. They are broken down into different sections. The first section you come to in the Old Testament is called the Pentateuch, which simply means the first five books. Uh, These are probably books we believe that were written or collected by Moses, and they talk about the creation of the world all the way through the establishing of Israel and the journey that God took humanity through to get to that place. The next part is the historical books, which tells the story of how did Israel interact with this God? How good were they at keeping the covenant? How did God respond to how they kept the covenant? You can look at Joshua through Esther this way. And then there's some wisdom literature in the next section. Like This is with Proverbs, Psalms, which is the hymn book, uh, Job, which is this ancient story. In fact, we think Job is probably the the first part that was ever written that deals with how come we believe there's a good God when there's evil in the world. And it goes from Job until Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. And then the the last part of the Old Testament is what we call the prophets. And you can break them down into major prophets and minor prophets, basically just on how long their books are. And these are messages from God to his people at different points of, in time in the history of Israel. And this uh, prophets section does have some things that, that talk about the future, but it has a lot of kind of conditional statements in it. Like, look, if you do what you're supposed to do, then this will happen. If you don't, then this is the consequence. Or because you have done this, Now God is going to do that. And these prophets come from all over the place. They really show the kind of wide background of who God calls and uses. There were rich people and poor people. There were people from rural communities and right in the middle of the urban centers. They had educated and non-educated. They had priestly and kind of outcast. Every kind of person and way of life is represented by one of the prophets Because God will speak through anybody. And then if you switch over to the New Testament, it's broken up too. So the first four books of the New Testament are the Gospels. These are biographies of Jesus. Now they're not exactly the same as biographies we have today. Like they're almost exclusively like for the first three years of his life. Maybe a a little bit for his first year or two. And they pay even, if you look at it that way, About half of each of the Gospels really only looks at the last week of his life in depth. So it's a little bit different than some of the ones that we have today. But I would say if you're new to reading the Bible, this is probably where you want to start. Read one of these. If you like things to come at you quick and you don't like a a lot of detail and you want to just go through the action, read Mark. He's kind of written that way. If you're a big detail person and you like to see all the little steps along the way, then read Luke. The way he writes kind of covers that way. Or if you're more of a big picture 
person, I would recommend you go and read John and see how he ties Jesus' life to all of the cosmos. After you get through the Gospels, you get to a book of history called Acts of the Apostles. And this tells, again, the story of the early church. And then following that, there are what we call epistles. And epistles are just letters. These are letters written by individuals to churches or other people. And because of the content of those letters and the way they talked about Jesus and God and what it meant to follow him in the world, we use them, too, to get those same standards and understandings. Most of them were written by a guy named Paul. But you also have letters from uh, two of Jesus' closest disciples and Peter and John. And then Jesus' brother, James, has a book in there. And i got to say, that, again, one of the biggest convincers for me that Jesus is who he says he is is that his brother believed it too and was willing to put his life on the line for it. And because the scripture is so vital to our relationship with God, because it's where the Holy Spirit speaks to us and also reads us as we read it, then we needed a a way to study it that would help us, maybe with memorizing, maybe with being able to, to go back and look at certain places a little bit easier. And so over the years, the system of chapter and verses was added to be able to access things. So let's, let's find one verse that's, that's fairly well known as an example of how to do this. So it's called John 3, 16 and 17. So the first part is John tells you which book in the Bible that you want to turn to. So you can turn to the book of John. And then it says chapter 3. So in most of them, there's these bigger letters up towards the top of some paragraphs. Those are the chapter numbers. So you can look along until you find the three, and you go there, and then each, pretty much each sentence, maybe sometimes a little bit more than a sentence or a little bit less, has what's called these verse numbers, and they're usually in there a little bit smaller. And so you can look down in chapter 3 until you find verse 16, and now you know exactly where we're going to be looking or reading when we talk about things together, and that's how you'll find it. So that's how the Bible is organized, so we're able to access it a little bit easier. And if we really want to experience God, if we want to know Him, and if we want to have the encouragement and hope that He gives us, if we want this to shape us, then we have to be able to approach it after we know how to get where we need to go in it. And if you really want to approach Scripture well, then you need to do a couple things. First, you've got to commit to it. I mean, set aside some time, partner up with somebody for accountability, you be committed enough to do it even when you're not feeling it. I mean, sometimes, I'll be honest, things are going crazy when I normally have time to do it, and it would be easy to skip out on it, but that's usually times when I need it the most, and so then it's like, okay, put it on audio, and we're going to do it while I'm driving, while I'm making breakfast. We're going to make sure we get to hear what God wants to say to me more than other things. Another thing you want to do to approach it, not besides just commit to it, is you want to use a plan. There's only so many times you can say, God, help me, and you just kind of flip it open and point, and you get what you need. That happens sometimes, but that's not a very good plan for a long-term way of studying your Bible. And so use what tools are available to you. If you have a phone, then you have access to what's called the Bible app. And on the Bible app, there are literally thousands of Bible reading plans that you can use and access. I'm using one right now to read through the Bible chronologically. If you want to do something like that, you can do that. If you want to read, uh, say you're struggling with depression or anxiety, you can look at plans specifically that have verses that deal with those things, those issues, and you can sign up and read through those. So use a Bible plan. Uh, Use devotional books that will have a scripture and then kind of break down some stuff for it. Or focus on the scripture from the message on Sunday and look at that during the week. Maybe read a little bit before, a little bit behind it. But use that as a guide for you. Just have a plan on how you're going to access the scriptures. And then if you've done all that, you're ready to get into it. 
And whether you're using a plan or an app or whatever, there's a method that you can use to not just read the scriptures, but pray God's words back to him and pray them with him. Now, you don't have to do this every time, and it's not something that, that maybe feels natural to everybody, but it's something I would encourage everyone to at least try a couple of times. There's four steps to this method, okay? And we're going to try it, if you want to try it together with me, we're going to try it together with those John 3, 16 and 17 verse that we read about. So the first thing is you want to prepare. So you want to put yourself uh, in a place that has little distractions, where there's a little bit of quiet, and then you're going to prepare your heart and your mind by praying something simple, maybe something like this. God, let me hear from you today. And after you've done that, you go to what you're going to read, and you read through it. Maybe you, you'll read it out loud. So here. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And after you've read it through once slowly like that, maybe even out loud, read through it again. And this time, see what captures your attention. Maybe a question pops in your mind, or a word or a phrase you get caught on, or maybe there's an a aha moment where, where God is literally kind of giving you something that you've never seen before. But look for that as we read through this again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And after you've read it two times, maybe you want to read it a third time, stop and reflect. I trust that God nudged you on something somewhere in the midst of it. Now chew on that. Why did this get your attention? What is God trying to say to you in the midst of what you are reading? So take some time to do that. Maybe you need to pause and then come back in a second for the last step. But do not miss out on reflection. And the final step is to respond so turn the reflection that you've been doing into prayer and pray it back to God. Maybe you need to record your thoughts or uh, state the questions and the insights that you got because both are valid and okay. And agree with what God has said to you and enjoy his presence for a moment before you get caught back up in everything else that is waiting for you when you leave the time you spent here. But I believe that if you're willing to go through these kinds of steps, if you're willing to consistently get into the Word of God, then He will do what He's promised to do. He will give you encouragement, He will give you hope, and His Word will not return empty because you will be caught up in the saving that He is doing. May these words be true for you, just as it was true for Paul when he wrote them to Timothy. There is nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way of salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Every part of scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us the truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the tasks God has for us. May you live in the midst of that saving plan each and every day. Amen.